We are so delighted that you stopped in today. Our desire is to provide you with scriptural teaching to bolster your personal walk with God. I trust you'll enjoy the selection. May you receive it with an open heart and a spirit of prayer. God bless you all. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to another Bible study on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. We're delighted that you have tuned in to be with us and are, trust that you have been enjoying these Bible studies, videos, and um, always glad to hear from you. And uh, we're thrilled that you've taken time out to be with us today. We're continuing our Bible study today on the theme of salvation. Uh, this will be our sixth lesson. We started out, of course, understanding that Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Understanding the definition of salvation is to pre preserve or deliver from harm, ruin, or loss. To be lost means to be unable to find one's way, not knowing one's whereabouts, denoting that uh, something has been taken away that cannot be recovered or even uh, could be used in the context of a competition where defeat has been sustained. We spoke about how there are two aspects of salvation. There is salvation now from the fruit of sin, and then we also talked about salvation later, and that being when uh, time has ceased and we go on to the life after this world. And we spoke about the three elements of salvation, election, uh, association, and behavior. Election, association, and behavior. We spoke about New Testament salvation, uh, pre-Calvary, uh, how Jesus healed the sick of the palsy and said, thy sins be forgiven thee. The woman caught in the adultery, very act of adultery. Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And of course, about the alabaster box that was broken and the, the uh, ointment that was used to anoint the feet of Jesus. Uh, Jesus said to that woman, thy faith hath saved thee, thee, go in peace. And then last week, we begin to speak of post-Calvary, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ salvation and in so doing we began in the book of acts which is the history of the new testament church and read a portion there in chapter two today we're going to begin to break down the message of peter there on the day of pentecost and uh, try to uh, help us understand how it pertains to our salvation today in acts chapter two and Verse 38, the Bible says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Just a few notes here in, uh, in, in beginning. First note that Peter's message came as a response to the Jewish uh, persons there uh, and their actions and their asking of Peter, men and brethren, what must we do? That is Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Peter preached to them, told them that they had killed the Messiah, that they were guilty of murder, and their response was, 
men and brother, what must we do? They understood that they had done wrong. The crowd was looking for hope. They were looking for a solution to their sinful behavior. And so Peter's sermon uh, was uh, accomplished its intent in that it brought conviction in their hearts and thereby uh, ultimately redemption. I want you to also note that uh, Peter's message in verse 39 said, Save yourself from this untoward generation. In other words, he was letting them understand or letting them to know, those to whom he ministered, preached, that they were to take personal responsibility for their own actions and uh, that they needed to be proactive in dealing with their sinful behavior. There is no question in studying this context, in studying of this sermon on the day of Pentecost, that it was a message of salvation. And it is, to this date, still an applicable message of salvation to us that are post-Calvary. We live after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. The first instruction that Peter gave to those that listened to him was that they repent. The word repent in the Webster's Dictionary means repenting or being penitent, feeling sorrow, especially for wrongdoing, uh, compunction, contrition, remorse. Urban's Bible Dictionary says repentance is this, and I quote, a complete change of orientation involving a judgment upon the past and a deliberate redirection for the future. General Bible uh, uh, definition that you might find on the internet or with your Bible program uh, is repentance is the act whereby one turns from his or her sin, idolatry, uh, creaturely rebellion, and turns to God in faith. If I could just, in simple layman's terms, define repentance it is simply asking God for forgiveness of errant behavior from a sincere heart and willfully endeavoring to redirect one's lifestyle to not repeat that action again. Repentance has to be verbalized. It needs to have a resolve of heart to change one's behavior. Here's a couple elements. True repentance can only come after one knows what God's directives are. Romans chapter 5 and verse 13 says this, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, if, if, uh, if, if there is no law, if there's no uh, established principles or directives, then how can we be uh, accused of breaking directives that are non-existent. And so uh, we understand that the law came, that we would know that we are lawbreakers and that our act activities and our actions are not acceptable unto God. Uh, Romans 1 and verse 20 says this, uh, that the wrath of God is revealed against all mankind, for the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Somebody may say, well, I don't know what the Bible says. I've never read the Bible. I'm, I'm uh, uh, uneducated concerning biblical law or biblical instructions. Well, the scripture tells us that even the invisible things of God, his eternal power and his Godhead, are seen through creation and that because of this no one has an excuse to say I didn't know somebody said one time the ignorance of the law is not is not uh, liberty from the law and so it is that it's imperative that we know the law so that we can proactively fulfill the laws of God repentance must be verbalized going beyond the realm of thought Thoughts are not communication. We have thoughts, I have thoughts, you have thoughts. They are not communication. It's not until we verbally 
uh, utter something that it becomes communication. Prayer is not meditation, and meditation is not prayer. Both of these have their, their positive attributes and their place in our lives. But when we want to speak to God, we must open our lips and speak because what is said is the ultimate and the final authority. If we are to repent, we must vocalize it. Matthew 5, 23 says this, Therefore, if thou bringest thy gift to an altar, and there, there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. There Jesus is saying in the in Sermon of the Mount, he said, if you've got a, if you got a disagreement with somebody, before you go to church, before you offer your your sacrifices at the at the tabernacle, the temple, if you will, you go first and make restitution. You go first and deal with that one to whom you have um, uh, mistreated or who is offended, has been offended by you. And of course, again, that would be the act of repentance. It takes proactivity and it would take some verbalization also. True repentance must be communicated. True repentance must also be actuated. When I mean actuated, it requires activity. It requires uh, a, a, uh, an act or a behavior. Uh, John stated this in, in Matthew 3 and 8, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. This is John the Baptist. He's looking at the Pharisees and called them a bunch of whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men bones. And he said, before you come bab to be baptized to me, which John offered a baptism unto repentance, he said, bring forth some evidence that you are genuinely repentant. And another place you'll find in James 2 and, and 26, faith without works is dead. So also, as James said, that faith is without works is dead, repentance without some work or some proactivity or actuated, it is non-existent. It is dead. Repentance can only come ultimately from God. Yes, we can ask people for forgiveness, but it is in satisfying the law of God that we do so. Because sin is an infraction against God's law. And therefore, as an infraction against God's law, it must receive forgiveness from and obtain forgiveness from God. Remember King David who sinned against uh, Uriah and the nation of Israel and that he took Bathsheba and committed uh, fornication with her and then turned around when Bathsheba came up as being pregnant. The Bible says that uh, David sent to uh, uh, Joab, I think it was, and had uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, put to death. You remember this story. Well, in that, in that, uh, in that uh, event, David turned around and prayed in the 51st Psalm, verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned. But wait a minute, David, you had Uriah killed, you committed fornication with the woman, uh, you caused uh, thousands of people because of the wrath of God that was placed upon, uh, that you chose, uh, was placed upon Israel. Thousands of people died until you offered your sacrifice. Uh, you, you, and, but yet you're going to say that your sin was only against God, yes, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Here's another one that I found very interesting today, and I'm studying this, this a little more in depth, preparing for uh, this discussion, this, this Bible study. Luke chapter 15 and verse 18, Jesus is talking about the prodigal son. When the prodigal son went back to his father, of course, uh, we, we can make the parallel there between our Heavenly Father and, and you and I and the prodigal son's father and 
uh, and uh, understand that it, it was a earthly message to, to convey a spiritual truth. But if you notice there that the prodigal son made this statement in Luke 15 and verse 18, I have sinned against heaven. The prodigal son told his father, I sinned against God, I sinned against heaven. And then his next phrase was, and before thee. He didn't say that he sinned against his father, he said he sinned against God, and that his sin happened in front of his father. How is that, you ask? Well, the Ten Commandments says, honor thy father and thy mother. And when you uh, commit a sin against your father and mother, or you go against their will, their directives, you have sinned against God. Forgiveness, the fruit of repentance, can only come by a blood sacrifice. Genesis 3 and 21, when the first uh, time we find sin on the face of the earth, the judgment came forth, and then after the judgment was made, then God uh, made for Adam and Eve a coat of skin and clothed them. That coat of skin had to come from the hide of a living animal. That animal had to be slain so that a covering could make, be made for their nakedness. Their nakedness was caused by their sin. and in innocence, which they were before they sinned against God, there is no nakedness. And everybody can understand that, I'm sure. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says this, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and, well, and without shedding of blood is no remission, and let me add this to these two words, of sin. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. The temple, if you ever study the, the Pentateuch and the building of the, the, uh, uh, the tabernacle, and uh, ever uh, study the dedication of Solomon's temple, you will see that blood ran freely. The temple was purified. The tabernacle was purified by blood. Sacrifices were a regular occurrence in the Old Testament. Even before the law was given by Moses, they were a regular occurrence. We see in the law of Moses extensive instructions on, on the sacrificing of bulls, lambs, goats, and doves, and uh, other creatures of like nature. But Jesus came as the ultimate and final sacrifice of sin. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That word gave meant, means that he gave his Son to die on the cross of Calvary. We see also in the, sec, in the second book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.19, that God was in Christ reconciling. How did that reconciliation take place? Through the blood of Jesus, reconciling the world unto himself. I'm going to read a, a couple long portions here, and this is the first one. It's found in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. You may not catch all of these, but this is this is just, just it's such a powerful uh, reading here. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to uh, uh, break it up and, and, uh, and, and put it in, in a more concise form. But labor with me here as I begin to read verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commerce thereunto perfect. The writer of Hebrews says the Old Testament sacrifice offered year by year could not make them perfect. Bulls and goats could not make them perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be for then would have they not ceased to be offered? Because, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again for sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he, being Jesus, Cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me 
Verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins thou hast no pleasure. Then saith I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the books it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifices and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure in them which are offered by the law. Then saith he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, to take away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus was the once and for all, the final sacrifice of sin. Look at First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain con conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You and I who have been raised around church know that old hymn, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Repentance is crucial. It is absolutely necessary, imperative, if one is going to receive the forgiveness of sins. It be, must be done unto Christ Jesus. For again, Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It must be done with a sincere heart and desire for change. And true repentance requires proactivity, restitution if possible, but for, moreover, a change of behavior. In Solomon's dedication of the temple, the temple that we call Solomon's temple, Solomon prayed a prayer, and let me read that again. It's a long portion of, of reading, found in Second Chronicles chapter 6, beginning in verse 36. If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captive into a land far off or near, yet if they bethink themselves in the land where they are carried captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly, if they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them away, and pray towards this land which thou gavest unto their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou from heaven, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. Solomon said, If the nation of Israel sins against you, Lord, and you by judgment take them into captivity and to a far-gone location uh, or nation, if they uh, change, have a change of heart, if they repent, and if they seek forgiveness of thee, hear from heaven and hear their prayer, O God. And then God responded to that prayer of Solomon in chapter 7, beginning in verse 12. I read a portion of it, and it says this, And the Lord appeared unto Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I choose pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins, and will heal their lands. God is faithful to answer if we will seek his favor. You'll notice in that context, humble themselves and pray. True repentance must be verbalized. Repentance is more than a thought. True repentance isn't just being sorry you have been caught. It is sorry that you have broken the laws of God. Seek my face. There is only one who can save from sin, and that is God. 
Again, I remind you that David said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And we find in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And then if they were to turn from their wicked ways, there must be a willful effort to modify behavior. And then there is forgiveness and there is no remembrance of sin with God and forgiveness. Repentance unto forgiveness is God's greatest gift to mankind. Isaiah 118 says, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse or rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. God said, come on now, let's reason together. Come unto me, all you that are weary. I think Jesus said this in heavy laden. And I'll give you rest. How do we find rest? Forgiveness of sin. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 13. Fear not, little flock. One of my favorite verses. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What a consolation. What a joy to know that it's God's good pleasure to give you salvation predicated on, of course, repentance. In conclusion today, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was the prayer of Jesus in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. He was hanging on the cross at that time and he looked down at those that were dividing his raiment and those that were cursing at him and those that were slandering him and those that were saying that uh, you know he could forgive others, but he himself he can't save. He could save others, but he can't save himself. Jesus, in the midst of all of that animosity that was directed towards him, said, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. If Jesus could grant forgiveness for those that, that unjustly crucified him, how much more could he grant forgiveness to the likes of you and I? I'm persuaded that God is able and willing to forgive the worst sinner in all the world. If he, could, if he could, and he did forgive a Simon Peter who denied him three times before the rooster crowed, he could have and would have forgiven Judas Issacharit had Judas went to the Lord in repentance also. Luke chapter 24 and 47 states this. This is Jesus telling the disciples what uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, their mandate is. It was that, they, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. That was the Great Commission. That was the mandate for the apostles. And the Spirit, Revelation 22, and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will, let him take of the waters of life freely. How do we come? The first step is through repentance. The road to, to forgiveness begins with repentance. It's a very simple thing to do. Re repentance, as we discussed in last, last uh, Bible studies, satisfies the behavioral element of salvation. Remember, we talked about election, we talked about association and behavior. Repentance satisfies, rectifies, cleanses all past behavior when we, by faith, seek God for it. Next week, we're going to discuss the second step in the, sec in the second chapter of the book of Acts, uh, that message of Peter on the day of Pentecost. We're going to talk about baptism. But until then, may the Lord bless you. May uh, you have a great week. And again, share these posts as you see fit. Leave us a remark. Uh, we're always thrilled to hear from you. 
May God bless you. Have a good day.